I would like to introduce you very briefly, Tony. Uh, you're a professor of design and social inquiry at the New School in New York. And between 2005 and 2015, you were professor and head of the design interactions department at the Royal College of Art in London. You studied industrial design at the RCA in the 1980s, then worked at Sony in Tokyo, and then you completed a PhD in computer-related design in the 1990s at the RCA again, and then founded in uh, 1994 the studio Dun & Gravy together with Fiona Ravy. So together you're running this practice which uh, works in academia, you publish books. Uh, these books were very influential um, for the discourse about design over the last decades, but you also teach a lot. Uh, and um, I'd like to speak with you about several of your projects, but also try to discuss a little more about the backgrounds of, of what you design and how you look at things, because reading your books is really uh, eye-opening, I think, for many people interested in, de in design, and so we shouldn't leave that out. Um, so where should we start? I, I think let, let's start with one project, or with a few projects of yours, you know, to um, get into some of the designs you created over the past 25 years. And one recent one that comes to my mind, because we had it in an exhibition uh, two years ago, an exhibition about surrealism, actually, is this um, project called Foragers, uh, the Objects for an Overpopulated Planet. I think these designs are quite typical for your work in the sense that they are um, designs for a speculative future, a future in which um, the Earth might not be inhabitable anymore or might not offer enough food for everyone or enough space for everyone. And then you take this fictional, rather dystopian future as a starting point for a work which is a design work. So you deliver real objects and then proposals how to survive in that work. But at the same time, of course, it's a speculative and also narrative um, work that is that makes us think about what design actually is and, and what the future of the world might, might be. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how this kind of project uh, was developed? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for um, having me here today. Um, <laughs> and it's the first time I've done um, a live Instagram thing, so I was concerned that I was logging onto the wrong space um, earlier on. I'm glad that we've connected. Um, yeah, that project was done, um, I think it started around 2009 and sort of finished a year or so later. And the very first part was a commission from an organization in South Africa called um, Design in Daba. And they asked five different groups to um, explore different possibilities for the future of farming. And this was presented in, I, I think, a Congress of Industrial Design in Singapore with the purpose of stimulating debate and discussion and so on. And at that stage, we were each asked to just produce a two minute um, video. And then later on, um, we were invited by um, Constance Rubin at the, for the um, St. Etienne um, Biennial, I think in maybe 2010, to um, curate um, a, a, a space, I guess. And instead we somehow through discussion managed to propose and have accepted the idea of developing that project a little bit and, and making them physical and, and working with photographers and writers and so on. So like a lot of our work, um, it takes many steps often to go from the initial idea and, and conversation and commission to the final outcome, often passing through several institutions on the way. Mm -hmm. But content wise, one of the main things we were trying to um, suggest, but not overtly in that project was that as designers, especially working with technology, there's a kind of a solutionist mindset, which is pretty obvious today, but maybe 10 years ago was less so. And we think that technology can fix all sorts of problems, whether political, social, economic, or whatever. And we wanted to um, turn the conversation around a little bit and suggest that maybe that rather than using technology and design to reshape the world out there to accommodate our ever expanding needs, maybe we should turn design on ourselves and adjust ourselves in a way to fit within the limits of the planet. And of course, in the project, we did that in a fairly dramatic and literal sense in, in making extensions to our digestive systems. But the idea really was to treat it as 
what we might need to do to our values, belief settings, systems, priorities, and attitudes, and so on. And in a way, that, that's kind of what the project was trying to do at that time. And, and somehow looking at what is currently happening with the pandemic, I guess um, the dystopia that is included in this kind of project has um, have become much more obvious today. And, and uh, so I suppose you also look at these works differently today than in 2009 when you created them, right? Yes, we do. But I, I think um, it's interesting you see it as dystopia. <laughs> We don't necessarily see it as such. I think visually it, it can uh, appear like that. Mm -hmm. but it's kind of trying to present more a, a different set of values, different beliefs, different things that are important to these people. So in our kind of narrative that we use to generate the project, we believe that the government and bit, uh, large industries were not going to solve uh, the problems that were occurring in farming at that time. And small groups of people would have to take it upon themselves to ad adjust and adapt to the world that was taking shape around them. Mm -hmm. And synthetic biology would allow them to modify their digestive systems in or order to thrive in that world. So partly the weirdness and strangeness of the designs is meant to suggest that this is a very different set of beliefs from our own world. And in our mind, it's, not, it's neither dystopian nor utopian. It's just um, a group of people responding to a world that's taking shape around them. And this is something we try to do a lot actually in our teaching is um, rather than sitting either in dystopia or utopia too, obviously, to try and find trade-offs and uh, dilemmas and design around those. So um, it depends on, um, you know, you can shift your point of perspective. Sometimes it can appear very dystopian, other times utopian. It, we've actually had cases where we've been teaching projects with two or three students and some of the students see their own pro the group project as a dystopia and others see it as a utopia. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. So that brings me to another project, which I would say uses a similar strategy, but looks at a, at a different topic. In that case, in the first one, you looked at the question of food, of, uh, of farming, and then you had this, um, it's probably your, your most famous project, um, They called the, the robots from the technological dream series from 2007, I think, where you looked at uh, different types of robots and um, you uh, gave them personalities or you, you turned the interaction around and speculated about uh, different characters and a certain type of interaction with them, right? Can you tell us more about, uh, about the intention of that project? Yes, um, again, I'll just say a little bit about where it came from. Um, it was a response to a commission from Jan Bolin at Z33 uh, in, as a, in a larger exhibition looking at the idea of critical design that um, mm. Marty Guiche and um, Jürgen Bay were also part of. And um, we were kind of at that time, it just come back, I think, from a trip from Japan where everything, even, you know, then was obviously technology is much more integrated into the environment. And robots there aren't necessarily seen as threatening or, or sinister, but something quite um, useful and constructive in everyday life. There isn't such mm -hmm. a, a boundary between artificial life forms and human life forms, which may also be to do with uh, very traditional, I suppose, historical ways that um, Japanese culture relates to the artificial environment, animism and so on. But we were interested in uh, taking the robots, I guess, When robots appear normally in design, it's changed now, I guess a lot, a lot of time has passed since that, but at that time, they were kind of very much the anthropomorphic robot, like a human figure or, or an animal, or you had the kind of fantastically impressive industrial robots that are always beautiful to watch, assembling cars and so on. Or at that time, automated systems were beginning to emerge, so kind of invisible networked robots. And whenever robots came into the home, they sort of brought some of that with them whenever they were imagined in the home. So we wanted to say, well, what if we start from a different position and treated robots as cultural objects like furniture, um, interior design elements, rather than appliances like washing machines and, and fridges and dishwashers? Mm -hmm. How might robots start to appear in the home? What kind of materials might they be made of? And we sort of focused on our interactions with them. We wouldn't be just a case of um, commanding them to do things or pressing buttons. Um, but maybe you have to negotiate a little bit. So the white one, I think, which is one of the most well-known images with a little wooden box, was meant to be a very powerful computer. We didn't really know what it did. 
in order to get it to do things, you had to pull it to a position and then uh, kind of give it instructions. And it would kind of plead to do a little bit, negotiate. But it was very, it was made of a very small size so that you, one of the things we we're concerned with as robots come into the home and as uh, high technology comes into the home, it could be quite intimidating. Mm -hmm. So how do you design the scale and the physicality to leave the kind of power with the human? So that one was meant to be almost child childlike and that's why it was designed in a kind of toy-like way. And we're also concerned that we're seeing it now with Alexa and those technologies that if technology comes into the house too quickly and too invisibly, we sort of forget it's present and all sorts of weird side effects begin to emerge. So we wanted the technology to have a, a very strong physical presence in the home, you're very conscious, you're cohabiting and coexisting with these other entities. And so we just, well, I guess one other thing we're interested in was how in the domestic interior, culturally, even just within the world of furniture, we've sort of more or less stopped with tables, chairs, shelving units, lighting, and that one of the robots was a wooden object and we were imagining maybe that that was a kind of a small mutation and evolution of the furniture world uh, meeting robotics. Is that interest in robots somehow connected to your early work with Sony in the late 1980s? Because I guess that must have been an interesting time when uh, you know, the, the idea of household robotics must, must just have um, uh, taken speed uh, before then it was it really became a, a, a common appliance. So what, what did you experience at Sony? What influenced you later? Um, I guess it wasn't directly related, but at Sony, I saw quite an interesting um, culture emerge, I guess. I was in the industrial design group, along with 300 mm. designers, styling TVs and other electronic products. And there was a small group of engineers that would normally, their regular job was to prototype, say, a new television or um, a CD player. So they would make the one-off miniature circuit boards that would allow everyone to test that product. But in their downtime, they were able to experiment with new technologies. And they were called um, um, dame, which in English looked like dame, and in Japanese means useless. And I always thought of them as a kind of a, a data group. And they would do things like one project that stuck in my mind was um, a collar. It sounds a little bit cruel, but it was a collar for a cat that um, whenever the cat meowed, it uh, played back a bark of a dog. And they were kind of just using voice recognition and voice synthesis to see what they could do. And of course, it was without any real concept. This sort of opened my eyes, I guess, to uh, another way of working, of prototyping these strange and, and weird objects that we could use to have conversations with. Um, rather than trying to sell and um, slick future visions um, through, which is what was happening in, they say, the industrial design side. So weirdly, this kind of renegade group of engineers um, sort of had quite a big influence on us, probably more so than the, than the design group. And I think that was probably the main thing I, I, I took away from Sony. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like some kind of cyberpunk approach <laughs> where, where people really were hacking the official technology and uh, it's an interesting... Yeah, interesting uh, inspiration probably at that time, um, because later when you came back to London, you uh, added a PhD in computer related design, right? So you mm. took that further and, and investigated yourself more in, <clears throat> into the early computer era, which at that time was still super new. No? I mean, the, uh, the internet was just about to, to appear. Uh, so uh, how did you look at that at that time? Or when did you realize how big the influence of digital technologies on our lives would become? Was it already in your mind? I think um, even as a bachelor's student, I was very interested in, let's say, the design challenges that electronic technologies were throwing up in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, in my bachelor's degree, I was banned from designing an electronic product uh, because it would be difficult to reconcile the aesthetic possibilities and the engineering possibilities with rigor. Because obviously, once you're dealing with electronics, form and aesthetics become a lot more fluid. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, I took a vacuum forming machine as my main topic and designed it in a kind of a, through the lens of Memphis, as a form of protest, and uh, luckily managed to <laughs> graduate. But I think, so I was always interested in technology, but I think... Um, it was living in Japan that Fiona and I really started to see how it could spill into everyday life in new and interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the experience of being there for three years, both at, at Sony Design in my case, and for Fiona in a very experimental small architectural office uh, run by Keiichi Iria, um, where he, um, he experimented a lot with how computers could play a part in um, overcoming our individual design voice. So for example, at that time, I think the second or third iteration of the Mac had come out mm -hmm. and we were using a very crude um, software and he had an approach called design by computer crash where we would model a model a model until it crashed and then turn those into physical models. And he actually used those kinds of issues, those kinds of elements in, in, in real world um, houses that he was designing at that time. But back in London, um, we wanted to kind of take the, the inspirations, I guess, we had experienced of seeing technology in a more positive light in Japan into a European context and, and see where that would take us. And we were working in a department called Computer Related Design, which was focused very much on um, interaction design, which I think may not, had just in the late 80s come about as a term, by, um, invented by or coined by um, Bill Mogridge. Mm -hmm. And from the very start, I think we were a little bit disturbed at how interaction design was closing the gap between people and technology, trying to make it seamless and transparent. So in, the ideal was you wouldn't even really realize you were um, using technology, which of course today, we're seeing the kind of disasters that that has resulted in. Mm -hmm. So we were very interested in maintaining some distance between people and technology. And in fact, we used to run a project for the students in computer related design called um, Inhuman Factors, mm -hmm. uh, rather than Human Factors, which tried to create um, distance and uh, obstacles and kind of uh, gaps between us and technology to, in a way, I think in, at that time, from the very beginning, we, we always felt, technology needs to remain at a distance. There needs to be a consciousness that you're interacting with a thing or a machine rather than trying to uh, close that gap. And a lot of our projects and ideas and thinking sort of grew out of that fairly simple starting point. Mm. Well, you said that you took on a more positive um, or constructive approach to technology when you came back to Europe. But um, you know, then in, in 2001, you published a book called Design Noir and in that book, I found some beautiful lines, which I would like to read because I think they're, uh, to me, this is really literature and, and very, um, and, and I'd like to hear your explanation later for that. <laughs> okay, I'll try. So, so, you know, I quoted, I have this here because I quoted it in an article about design and surrealism uh, that I published two years ago in a book. And uh, so to me, that sounded quite surreal. And I, I'd like to hear your thought about or what, what were the background. So you're, you're writing together with Fiona, beneath the glossy surface of official design lurks a dark and strange world driven by real human needs, a place where electronic objects co-star in a noir thriller, working with like-minded individuals to escape normalization and ensure that even a totally manufactured environment has room for danger, adventure, and transgression. They form part of a pathology of material culture that includes aberrations, transgressions, and obsessions, the consequences and off and motivations of the misuse of objects and object malfunctions. They provide glimpses of another more complex reality hidden beneath the slick surface of electronic consumerism. Whoa. <laughs> That, that was about 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know when people read things to me that I've written long ago, it's, it's really a torture. So I hope it works <laughs> for you. Um, but I like that, that quote. So uh, I, what, what are you thinking when you're hearing that today? I think, uh, I, think I still believe in it. I think that um, at that time, we were working in, a, as I said, the computer related design lab at the RCA, which gave us tremendous freedom to um, question and challenge and uh, interrogate some of the assumptions behind technology. But at the same time, we were constantly encountering the kind of visions they've been put forward by Silicon Valley in the late 90s, um, the tech industry and consumer companies. And they seemed just so narrow and restrictive on, on the scope they allowed, allowed in our mental lives and our imaginative lives and so on. And as I kind of mentioned with the cat experiment earlier on, we're always fascinated with looking for examples where people were maybe expressing very different ways of being in the world through technology that mm. maybe aren't always positive, but they kind of create some sort of powerful reaction or, or, or experience. And so I think um, 
we were trying to bring the two worlds together at that point, looking at this unofficial world of experimentation, amateur obsession, um, hacking, artists' work, and contrasting it or bringing it into a forced conversation with the industrially designed and interaction design world, trying to say, look, you know, why aren't we um, looking further and trying to um, use these amazing technologies to really facilitate a much richer um, form of life? And I think looking back today, I think it's actually today way more dystopian than we ever imagined when we were doing our little experiments in the 2000s. Yeah, but when, you, when I hear you speaking, uh, you still consider yourself an industrial or a designer. It's not an artist approach where you, where you just create free installations, but what you create, you, you would consider as design in a sense that it, it can be used, uh, even though in a fictional context. So would you say, I know it's, it's a question that doesn't have to be answered and on which so just, if I hear you speaking, I would say this is the approach of a designer, right? I think we like to think of ourselves, say, operating within the world of design, in the context mm. of design. I think people might debate whether we're designers or not, mm. and that's fine. But I think the realm that we work in, and sometimes we kind of joke to ourselves that maybe we're artists, but we take design as our topic. Mm. And we like investigating the stories that design tells itself, its history, its dreams and fantasies, methods. Um, approaches and so on. But I think if we um, do, when we do present ourselves as designers, I think what we're trying to argue for is a much more expanded um, world of design. Of course, there's industrial design and design that works within an, an industry context. There's craft design and so much more. But we'd like to see a more um, theoretical form of design happily coexist and be in dialogue with these other forms of design. And I guess we champion that side, the kind of kind of design that can feed into a richer discourse about what design is and what design could be and what it has been as well. And uh, we like to do that by doing projects, by designing. So for us, our design projects are more like experiments where we're testing ideas and seeing where they take us. And then when we write, we try to reflect on what we've learned or haven't learned or how those experiments have gone. Mm. And really the only place we find that we can do that is in an academic setting. It's an environment where research is meant to happen, it's about the development of new ideas and new knowledge. And in that world, I guess our, our battle always has been how not to end up just endlessly writing academic papers, but mm -hmm. continuing to use design <clears throat> projects and forms of design as, as ways of exploring ideas. And so far, I think we've managed to do that. Yeah, yeah. And um, do you also see a, <clears throat> an influence, sorry, uh, an influence of the, the design work that you're creating on actual let's say, more mainstream product design? Or did you take the, the way via the discourse to, to have an influence on the design world? Is there, is there a direct way from your, direct link from your work into product culture, you would say? I'm not sure that's a really interesting question. I mean, I would hope so, but I would assume if there is, it must be indirect mm -hmm. where people are, um, resonating maybe with some of the ideas we're exploring mm -hmm. and finding ways of um, exploring them or applying them maybe in a different context. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. But have you ever collaborated with one of the tech giants, for example, directly? Have you ever been in touch with Google or Apple or uh, <laughs> Amazon? To, it would be super interesting. <laughs> um, we have. Um, for a while, from around 2000 to 2005, mm -hmm. we um, had a very minimal involvement with the RCA. I was teaching one day a week in Ron Arad's design products department, and Fiona was teaching in architecture. And we ran a, a studio with, with designers, and we worked with clients for about five years. And many of those clients were, were tech companies, a lot of them in telecommunications, um, and some um, doing um, electronic products. But even then, when they came to us, it would usually be to do some experimental or conceptual work that would only be shown internally in the company. And that's one of the reasons we stopped doing that work. We, it was fascinating at times, but we could never, ever show it to anyone. We were just doing one project after the other that we'd have to seal in a folder and move on. And it was, you know, I think it, in one case, very sadly, a, a project of 10 different conceptual products looking at... Um, around the kitchen, looking at a more ecological way of working with, um, you know, power sources, water and so on. 
um, was kind of, it wasn't prototyped, it was sort of modeled. And then I think it made its way into a display on a dishwasher <laughs> at some point. And I think at that point we realized the gap is just too big between the conceptual work and the, uh, the reality of, of mass production. But we have many friends and ex-students and uh, colleagues that we studied with um, who work in, in companies like Apple and, and Google mm. and uh, Philips and, and Sony. And we're, we're, we're always in dialogue and exchanging ideas. And it's really fascinating for us to often pursue um, shared interests but from these very different contexts and see what we can learn from each other. So I'm not sure if... Uh, so you think there is an influence of, of yours uh, through these connections on, on the practice of uh, these companies? I wouldn't go that far. I'd say we're maybe part of a community of um, designers. Let's just take the idea of futures, for example, mm. or design fiction or speculative design. We're kind of part of, a, I guess, a loose group of people who are interested in this sort of thing. We do it from an academic and experimental context. There are others doing it within large corporations like Google and previously in Philips. And yeah, we, we kind of exchange ideas and we, we sort of look at it from different perspectives, but it's more to um, expand our own thinking. And I'm sure those designers are probably thinking the same rather than consciously trying to see how that might translate into uh, new products or approaches to technology. Yeah, so when you, when you initiated this, this approach to design in the late 1990s, your first book was in 1999, Arts and Tales. Um, this approach was rather radical because the 80s and 90s were two decades where it was all about the product, about uh, consumption, about the, the aesthetics, uh, starting with Memphis in the early 80s, but also continuing in the 90s with little discourse, um, a lot of products that were brought on the market. There were some movements like growth design who were testing different approaches, but what, what brought you to question the design practice so radically and turn towards academia and to, to coin a term like critical design, which then became very influential for a new mindset? How did that come about? Well, lots of different factors. It's probably going to sound a bit neater when I say it than it actually was in reality. But I guess um, from very early on in my bachelor's degree, um, I still remember the moment a book of on Ettore Sotsas written by Penny Spark uh, landed on my lap and basically just opened my mind to this radically different way of, of thinking about design as a much richer, more poetic um, support to our lives. And ever since that moment, I, I was just fascinated by that world. And over time, I guess I realized most of the work happening in that area was happening through furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, even Drew, who you mentioned on drug design, uh, concentrated mainly in furniture, although they did do things like the electric bell and some other really nice low-tech products. And so with the, the PhD that I did at the RCA, it was a, a moment to try and explore, well, how can we kind of take some of that thinking and some of that history and shifted over into a world of, of high technology at that time, digital technology. Mm. And what would start to happen when that sensibility met with digital tech, um, radio, um, the internet, and so on. And so it was kind of a taking pre-existing ideas, I guess, to a certain extent, and just trying to bring them into industrial design and interaction design, which were a lot less critical than furniture design yeah. and craft design, for example. But um, so we were looking at, you know, we, we looked at kind of, um, I say we are talking about Fiona. Fiona, of course, coming from an architecture background, had been constantly exposed to a much broader range of, of ideas and histories and theories, going, you know, literally going back hundreds of years, where there's a much richer uh, breadth of possibilities. And, and I myself was, was fascinated by architecture too. And people like Libius Woods were an incredible influence in the early days. But I think... Um, it was that challenge of looking at that, that aspect of mainly Italian radical um, design and seeing what can be learned from that when we're dealing with uh, technology in the 80s and 90s. Mm. There are also other influences, I guess, that came from fine art, like Panamarenko, who was dealing with his amazingly poetic flying machines, where he was trying to avoid the usual uh, streamlined thinking of aerodynamics and looking at other slightly strange, sometimes maybe even non-functional theories of flight, hinting at other laws of physics. And then people like Christoph Odichko, who also started as a, an industrial designer in Poland in, in, I think, probably the 70s, 
and took an a, a, a extremely political um, stance there and developed many vehicles and, and critical objects that critiqued the political regime at that time. And I think his use of objects, but very much within the fine art context to critique um, systems and politics was very influential to us. But again, we wanted to say, okay, he's doing it in the fine art context. What would that start to look like if we were trying to do that in an industrial design context, for example? Oh, that's super interesting to hear these different um, influences, also the, the radical design influence, which I've never thought about. Um, but in fact, what they did is to question technology to question the, the function of design in, a, in an economical system where it has always had the, the function of um, increasing consumption, um, creating an economic value. And what they did, the radical designers, is to uh, undermine that no? and, and, and show that design can have a different role as a tool of critique. Um, so it's, it's interesting that this attitude, which also Sotsa somehow forgot a little bit in his Memphis years, no? that <laughs> yes. years, uh, in the 1990s, um, and uh, also in the 1970s, there were interesting examples for that in the Alchemia before Memphis and in the uh, Global Tools group in, in Italy. Um, and you also mentioned Daniel Bayer, right, uh, as, a, yeah. as another influence when we spoke before this conversation. Yes, I'll mention him in a minute. And also Andrea Branzi, who um, yeah. wrote a wonderful book in the 1980s that I, I'm sure is no longer in a publication called Hot, uh, The Hot House. And he surveyed um, quite obscure um, Italian design movements, ideas and practitioners that probably today, uh, I know many of them have been forgotten. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful um, handbook. And I think, uh, I'll just say one more thing about that. I think it, always op it also opened our eyes to the fact that there's no design, you know, one design, mm. that there are all these multiple versions of design. And at that time in Italy, they were almost like different worlds or, or different ideologies. And I think we've carried that with us ever since too, that, they, that today we would love to see a multiverse of design approaches, um, none necessarily right or wrong, but all rubbing up against each other, creating sparks and enriching each other. Yeah. Not stylistically, but much deeper. But yes, you mentioned Daniel Weil. I think um, when I was um, a student, he um, had probably been to the RCA, um, I don't know, he was kind of the generation before, mm -hmm. and he had designed a series of electronic products. The most famous, I think, was the radio in a bag. And he seemed, he was drawing a lot from, again, the Italian um, tradition. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for me, he was a link between those worlds where he was showing how that world of Sotza, Spranzi, Global Tools, all these kinds of Italian thinkers could kind of, um, that kind of thinking could transition into the world of contemporary products and that spirit. And his products were all um, fully working and um, handmade or batch produced and incredibly inspiring for us. And um, I think, uh, yeah, I've kind of kept in touch with him over the years and it's always been really refreshing to uh, have a dialogue with him about yeah. what's happening in design or not happening. I mean, when we think about inspirations uh, or influences, I, I also think about Andreas Brunzi's, Andrea Brunzi's other book from the 1980s, Animali Domestici, Household Pets. Mm -hmm. He launched the idea of seeing a piece of furniture as a being <clears throat> that lives with you. And so I, I think there the perspective starts to change. You know? Suddenly, the piece of furniture can become the spy and it looks at you like <laughs> uh, the robot would look at you and, and form a kind of symbiosis with you and you have to get along with each other. And so I, I, I see a certain relation with your idea of the, the household robots that you questioned them in 2000, mm -hmm. the robot series. That's true. Um, and, and I mean, if we take that further, would you also say someone like Achille Castiglioni, who, who also was interested in turning around objects, maybe in a still more industrial age, not this digital age, but to me, he is really one of the first who started to hack objects and to think about mm -hmm. a completely uh, apparated or disuse of something which leads to another use and the rediscovery of, of the object. I think so, but probably, I mean, to be honest, 
it's it's a side of design that I'm, I've looked into less. You know, I appreciate the work enormously and, and can appreciate what you've just said. But my lens on Italian design was definitely on the side where they were trying to draw connections between, overt connections between their practice and the political realities of the time or the challenges that they were facing. So I've kind of, uh, I haven't looked as closely at his work, although yeah, yeah. I'm aware of, of the philosophy. Um, you were included in two exhibitions, which I would like to briefly mention, because they are very different in, in the approach. And, um, and uh, one is the, the famous Broken Nature exhibition that has been curated by Paola Antonelli uh, two years ago during the Milan Triennale. So there you were placed in the context, as the title indicates, of, of the exhibition, of uh, a strong statement that Paula made about uh, the humans aggressing our ecosystems and uh, showing design works which either reflect or critique that or uh, propose solutions. Um, how, how do you see your work in relation to that such a concept. Would you say you are uh, you are um, criticizing um, certain uh, uh, unawareness for sustainability? Are you fighting for that? And in what way? I think your your work is very <clears throat> subtle in that way. But on the other hand, you clearly get a message. I think um, since even that project, the Foragers project criticality in a way has gone mainstream and i don't mean mainstream in design i mean you open a newspaper now and there are articles analyzing um, bias in ai you turn to netflix and there's uh, you know wonderful documentaries on um, the issues surrounding social media and its addictive nature and then uh, even you know programs like black mirror so i think um what's interesting for us is to say well if all of this criticality is going on what can design add? Or can it even add anything? Or is it just repeating the kind of same old critiques? And so I think what we're interested in is trying to move beyond the critique to seek out kind of maybe alternative ways of being, alternative mindsets, alternative ways of understanding and making sense of the world. And then using the tangibility of design to, to bring those ideas into a public realm. So I guess they're critical in that they're rejecting the kind of status quo or the, the main ways of, of thinking at the moment, but they're less overtly critical probably than our earlier work where we'd zoom in on a particular issue and try and use design to concretize that. But when we look around at the moment, we see criticality everywhere. Yeah. And uh, we're wondering, well, what lies beyond that? What's going to emerge from, from this uh, extremely turbulent phase? Mm. So in the nature, in relation to kind of natural environments. I think since moving to America, we've become fascinated by the idea of wilderness um, and the kind of what it means to go into the wilderness as a human. I know there's complex political histories behind the wilderness, but just as a phenomenon, it's kind of making us think a lot about maybe moving the other way. What happens when you bring the wilderness into design as a metaphor or even design education as a wilderness? What would that start to look like and what kind of new possibilities might emerge from that sort of framing of education rather than the, the kind of current highly constrained uh, models we have now. So it's kind of, so kind of a long answer, but I think what we're saying is rather than trying to um, project an idea, an idealized idea onto nature that, or, or our relationship to nature or the natural world, we're kind of maybe trying to bring it the other way into design. What can we learn mm. from these kinds of different kinds of natural worlds that are, are wilder and um, less human centric? I love the idea of the wilderness, uh, introducing that into design. That makes me think of Claude Lévi-Strauss, the, the La Pensée Sauvage, um, the, the savage, savage mind is mm -hmm. in, in English. And he compares the engineer, uh, which is the, the rationalist approach, with a bricoleur. So it's the you know, yes. person who tries out things and works with try and error and improvises. And um, so th that brings me to the second exhibition I wanted to speak about, where you were included. It's an exhibition of our museum, which was about the relation of design and surrealism. Mm -hmm. And um, I briefly spoke with Fiona about that, whether she feels okay with being included in such an exhibition. <laughs> she said yes. So, um, you know, there we, we wanted to, 
on the one hand, it was a historic exhibition with works by you know, Dali, Max Ernst, uh, Merit Oppenheim. But then we wanted to show that the surrealist mindset, the attitude or the approach to reality um, has parallels. Maybe it has influence, but maybe it's just mirrored uh, in, in certain design attitudes of the past 50 years. And it has contributed also to, to liberate designers from just seeing themselves as service providers and working for the industry. But it has shown designers that if artists can imagine a reality beyond reality, which is called surrealité, or the surrealism, why shouldn't designers be able to do that? And, and that, that was for me the, the link where your work came in, where you often imagine a whole different reality. So you show we don't have to limit our perspective on one reality. There's plenty of realities that we can design and that we can design for. So would you say, seen from that lens, it makes sense to uh, have shown you in the context of uh, the surrealist influence on, on design? Yes, absolutely. I remember when Fiona was discussing with you and we were also wondering what would it mean to be included mm -hmm. in, in that sort of context. And I, I think, yes, we arrived in the same space as you did, mm -hmm. that it, it does make sense. There's this aspect to surrealism that is about um, kind of other realities and other worlds that, that we connect with very well. And I think also our inner worlds, again, often as designers, we're very... Um, focused on transforming and manipulating the world out there, the, the physical environment. And I guess a lot of our work has been more on working to our inner worlds mm -hmm. and how we rethink the worlds we carry around inside us, because ultimately that's the world, those are the worlds that are going to kind of uh, determine what kind of physical environment we have. So this kind of focus on our inner worlds, I think, was also resonated with us as well. And of course, surrealism is drawing from that in many, many different ways. Yeah, that makes total sense to me, yes. Mm -hmm. So the exhibition is now, uh, will be opening in Madrid, has been shown in Barcelona, uh, and it will go to the San Diego Museum of Art, wow. and to a few other museums. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll uh, see your works again in that show uh, <laughs> throughout the years. Um, uh, Tony, one last question before we maybe take some questions from, from our visitors, from the audience. Um, the teaching plays a very important role uh, mm. for you as a designer. And uh, you've mentioned that um, several times already today. Um, what, what would you say is your approach as a teacher? I mean, working so much in, in, a, in a narrative, speculative way, I, I'm sure you must be a wonderful teacher. I, I <laughs> suppose the students love uh, your, uh, your approach. Is there a certain methodology or a certain perspective on design that you try to convey to your students um, with how you work and how you teach? I think, it's, I think it's evolving all the time. And obviously we're now part of a very different system here in the States. So it's really helping us think through um, what teaching means to us and how about we go about doing it. But I think one of the things we try to do, maybe it sounds a little bit banal, <coughs> <this, coughs> excuse me, is we try to set up a kind of a conceptual environment where people can um, kind of learn for themselves, but not in a completely random sense. It's like designing the conditions for learning. And that's the environment, it's the sources you bring in, the references, the projects you set, the readings, the discussions, and so on. And then it's seeing what emerges. And it's that seeing what emerges, that's the fascinating thing for us. And, and obviously mm. the really rewarding thing, because it doesn't just stop at the class or at the graduate, but maybe 10 years later, you're still seeing um, people doing amazing work. Um, and you can sometimes see the seeds of those in, in little small um, things they did when they were students. Mm -hmm. But I think um, it's, it's very much yeah, about, I'd say, setting up conditions where a certain kind of learning can happen um, mm -hmm. through practice. And, and since moving to New York, we've been I'm working a lot, not just with design students, but philosophy students, anthropologists, um, political theory students, and so on. And trying to find ways of doing that across different media that include writing as well as designing mm -hmm. um, and traditional seminar formats as well as studio practice. And it's really, really interesting, I think, seeing the ideas flow both ways between design and the social sciences and, and the other way too. Mm -hmm. But no, I'm sorry, that wasn't a very good, I don't really have a, <laughs> a magic formula. <laughs> 
I, I think there is no, none. But um, <laughs> is, uh, when you speak about writing, um, is it, how, how does it work to write a book with two authors? Uh, is each one writing one chapter or are you really co-writing? How does it work? Or is one of you the, doing the first draft and then the other one is uh, reworking it? How does it work? It works a lot through discussion. I mean, basically very, very intensive um, talking and interacting and building up the ideas like that. And then one of us will usually try and get those ideas down on paper in a coherent voice. Mm -hmm. And then the other one will dive in and start to work with it, edit it, move it around. Mm -hmm. And we sort of do that on, on the scale of, of pages and chapters and then with the whole book as well. Mm -hmm. So I think um, discussion for us is probably the, the main medium, mm -hmm. uh, always talking. And then we take on different roles, even within a project, we have to take on different roles. And then that fluctuates and switches about um, from project to project as well, mm -hmm. and even in teaching. That reminds me of two, uh, two German design teachers and writers, uh, Uta Brandes and Michael Erhoff, <laughs> through whom we first met. Um, yes work in a very similar way. It's a couple that speaks a lot, discusses a lot. Maybe they are even watching us today. They told me that they, are, <laughs> they have been following. So they should send a sign if they are here. Um, so I think that's a wonderful practice to, to mm. um, really speak a lot, discuss things, and then um, work together in, a, in the field of design. Um, Tony, one, one last question, uh, because when uh, when you work with students, you, you're constantly confronted with the next generation of designers and with how that generation will shape design in the future. And I think really few designers of the past two or three decades have been so, have anticipated so much of what then came in, in design uh, uh, one or two decades later, looking at what you published in the late 90s and what happens today. So I would like to take the occasion, now that I have you here, to, <laughs> to hear what, what is your, um, your look into the future of, of design and of the role of designers um, for the next 10 or 20 years? I know it's, again, it's a <laughs> challenging question and we, we have another <laughs> two hours. No, but uh, maybe some thoughts that, that come to your mind at the moment. I think there are more hopes um, than thoughts you know I think um, I would love to see a kind of intellectual richness and seriousness and, and diversity emerge in design that can um, that has a robustness you know it can exist um, in the universities but outside the universities it can be related to museums like yours to industry and that does working for industry and with industry maybe it's just one possibility amongst many different roles that designers can take on. And of course, looking at the younger generation today, you can see that very clearly. They're, they're moving in many different directions and are rejecting and critiquing um, previous roles, quite rightly, uh, for design. But there needs to be an ecosystem that can support that as well. Publishers, uh, opportunities for publishing, um, museums like yours, experimental spaces, ways of funding all this work. And uh, my hope is that somehow that begins to happen. I think in the areas like architecture, it's pretty well established. It's, it's been around for centuries. Graphic design seems to also have a very vital and uh, exciting kind of culture. But 3D product, industrial interaction, the kind of space we're in mm. seems to be less developed in that way. And uh, it's, it's quite practical, but that's something I, I, I'd be very interested in seeing. I mean, even, what does that even mean? What does it mean to have a healthy intellectual ecosystem that can allow very diverse forms of thought to thrive? At the moment, it sort of happens in the cracks and the gaps or by accident or by chance. And it's, it's not very sustainable. And I think the intellectual ecosystem is there. But as you mentioned, it's easier in graphic design to work that way than in uh, with 3D objects because it needs manufacturing, it needs a certain production infrastructure, and, um, and it's more costly to, to uh, experiment that way. Absolutely. But, but it's, it's super important. And I think what has, been, what has been looked at as a big promise was 3D printing. You know, if you remember, mm. it was about yes, yeah. people were supposing that everything will be 3D printed in, in a few years' time. 
think that reality looks a little different. What, what would mm -hmm. be your outlook for that technology? It's become a little more silent around 3D printing, but I had a talk mm -hmm. with Mary Oxman um, a while ago where she, I mean, you know her work. She uses 3D printing technology in a, in a super mm -hmm. interesting way. So we, we just say it's just a different phase of evolution of that technology. Will it re-emerge as a breakthrough or will it just become one technology among many others? I don't know. I mean, I, I think it will probably become one technology, a very useful technology amongst many others. But if you look back to the sewing machine, you know, we've always been able to make our own clothes. Uh, I have friends who do that, um, but very few people do. And uh, if you look at cooking, uh, we can all cook for ourselves, um, but we still enjoy going out to restaurants with someone who's spent 10 or 20 years refining their craft can offer us a dish. So I think the rhetoric around 3D printing, somehow democratizing objects or design maybe is less likely to come true. But as a useful technology, I, I, I'd be surprised if it didn't. But just uh, one thing I'd like to add to, maybe this is another hope rather than uh, some kind of prediction, is I think um, what a lot of the kind of problems that have arisen with technology recently has shown is that the mindset or the worldview behind technological development is highly problematic and broken. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that would be that we're interested in, I guess, is what does it mean to reimagine worldviews and ways of making sense of the world? You know, working with philosophers, anthropologists, and people who really try to look into the meaning of reality itself. And can design be used to kind of open up that space? So we're exposing people to literally other ways of being and other realities. Because I think until we change the way we actually think, we're kind of doomed. And uh, so we can have this conversation or that conversation about technology in its future. But if we can't actually figure out what can design contribute to the reimagining of our world views and ways of seeing the world, I'm not sure it's going to lead somewhere. And that's something I think we're trying, well, one of the reasons, in fact, why we moved to the new school was that we could immerse ourselves in, in these kinds of conversations with people who've been thinking about this stuff for way longer than we have. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tony. That was a wonderful closing remark. Um, so there's still a lot to expect from you in the coming year. <laughs> you made me curious even more. Um, but thank you for the conversation. And for the great work and inspiration for many designers and curators and uh, uh, thinkers. Um, so uh, I hope to see you in person very soon. I hope the audience was able to uh, take away inspirations and information about your work from that talk. And um, for all of you who haven't been able to listen to the whole talk, we will put it on our Instagram TV channel. So you'll be able to look at it on the Instagram feed of the Vitra Design Museum in, I think, two or three days, and we'll also have it on YouTube. So um, that is another way to seeing that discussion and to making it available to, to a large and global audience. And thank you so much for, for this opportunity. And wonderful to talk to you. I really enjoyed the questions. You've kind of touched on areas of our work and thinking that have kind of become a little bit dusty. <laughs> and it was nice to be able to revisit them and, uh, and talk about them with you and hear your questions and, and thoughts. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you, you, you deal with the future in your works and with new technologies, but I think there's already also a history of this kind of approach. You know, now you're practicing it since the 1990s. And I think it's interesting to understand where did it come from and how was it shaped? Um, because, you know, the world is going so fast and innovation and discourse is changing so quickly that I think we also, sometimes it helps to look at it from a little distance. And, you know, as a museum person, I'm always interested in historicizing things. So even though um, <laughs> as a designer, you might not like that. Um, that's what happens when you speak to a museum person. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think um, we've uh, hanging out with people in the humanities. We've gained a new appreciation and respect for history. Yeah. Okay. Well, Tony, the same my regards to Fiona. It was a big pleasure to speak to you and hope to see you in Fiona soon. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.